Hello, um, welcome to another video essay. Today I have got um, a very new creation of mine. Um, so I haven't bought a microphone yet because I'm kind of waiting to see if it'll be worth it spending the money on one because I don't want to buy a cheap, like a shitty one. I want to like invest in a nice one. Um, so someone very kindly pointed out to me in the comments that I should cover my phone in a sock to prevent the plosive sounds. So. Here I am. Um, thank you very much for your suggestion. I hope everyone's doing well. I was just thinking to myself that I want to start every video off with just a suggestion, like a small recommendation. It could be related to the video or not. Um, uh, yeah, so this week's recommendation is, uh, God, I don't know how to hold this, um, a kind of podcast slash playlist station thing. Um, on Spotify called This Is Post Bossa by John Rosborough, who is an artist who I've loved for a number of years now. I don't know if he started the genre of post bossa, but it's like a fusion of, it's like a kind of indie alternative genre inspired by the music of Brazil. So in this show, it's seven episodes of really, really good music. A lot of them I already knew, a lot of them I didn't know, um, including Brazilian bossa nova and the bebe, um, samba. It gives a really good context for the creation of bossa nova music. I love the way he talks about um, his own music, so yeah, that's a really, really good show that I would recommend to anybody who's looking for some new music. Um, but yeah, let's just get into it. I know what? Well, get the prince to give her a snog! Hello! Come on, prince, give her a snog! When this video was filmed, I was probably around three years old as I just started nursery. And I remember vividly that by this age, I'd already established the idea that the blonde, blue-eyed princess was the most beautiful and I wanted to be just like her because the brunette queen was ugly and old. And a few years later, when my younger sister was born, I knew that she was prettier than me for having fairer features. Upon starting school, I remember feeling ugly and not girly enough in comparison to my blonde, lighter friends, and when I started ballet, I felt like I would never be small enough to be a prima ballerina. So, it's interesting for me, who grew up feeling kind of like the ugly duckling, to now receive comments like the following, which make me question whether I deserve to be commended for my intellect, or whether any attention I get is purely based on how I look. So this got me interested in the conversation about pretty privilege and I think that before we get into it, I think we have to discover or explore what we even mean by beauty as such. Is it a social construct or is it a concrete thing? Um, I went back to ancient philosophy, so I delved back into my um, A-level notes to answer some of these questions. Plato observed that objects we know about are always changing from one moment to the next, and as soon as people think they understand something, it's different again. He wanted to come to understand how we attain true knowledge, despite the inevitability of impermanence, so he developed the theory of forms to explain this, and this shows why he saw beauty in the way that he did. Plato believed that things were perceived as beautiful because they participate in the higher objective form of beauty. Therefore, beauty itself is objective, and thus not in the eye of the beholder, or that of subjective experience. Beauty exists beyond our senses, and exists regardless of whether anyone is around to sense it. Heraclitus also noticed impermanence in the world around him, stating that no man ever steps in the same river twice, for it's not the same river and he's not the same man. There is nothing permanent except change. This change can be observed in the winners of Miss Universe through the years. There's a huge difference between winners like Armi Kusella and Christiani Martel to Hanaz Sandu and Andrea Mesa. I also touched on this change in how we categorise beauty in my first video, The Return of Her and Chic, where I go through body trends through time and show how the idea of the perfect body changed so much throughout history. So is there a form of beauty as suggested by Plato? 
or is our beauty something that changes according to our perceptions, like Heraclitus's river? To answer this, I googled the most beautiful women of 2023, and I came across a huge variety of answers. So, according to Pernia University in Wariley and Technosports, it's Jodie Coma. According to Oxgaps, it's Deepika Padukone. According to Style Craze, it's Zuzibini Tunzui. Um, but Albi.org says it's Bella Hadid. Yale Shebia is stated by New Vision Theatres, and Lalisa Manoban is stated the most beautiful woman of 2023 by Hyderabad DCCB. Although there's a huge range in their beauties and how they look, they don't really look anything alike. Their beauty is calculated, I guess, in the same formula, which is the golden ratio, which was used by artists and architects during the European Renaissance to map out their masterpieces. Apparently, Bella Hadid's chin is only 0.3% away from being perfect, with a score of 99.7%, according to Dr. Julien de Silva, who is a facial cosmetic surgeon at Harley Street. I just think it's so weird how <laughs> we've put women's beauties into percentages. But when you think about how typical Renaissance women were depicted, it seems strange to think that this measurement is still being used to calculate beauty nowadays. I mean, it was a popular beauty trend back in the day to shave your hairline to make your forehead appear bigger, so... I think <laughs> I must have bought in the wrong century because I was made fun of my forehead for when I was younger. Here is what some celebrities would look like if their faces fit the golden ratio. You can really see the resemblance to medieval paintings and it makes you question why it's still being used today when our beauty standards have changed so much. A video essayist I really like called Khadija made a video called Beauty is in the Eye of the Colonizer and she mentioned the process of Uhagoro which was teeth blackening and it was a very popular tradition during the Heian period in Japan from 794 to 1185. It was seen as a symbol of beauty and maturity. Teeth were blackened using a solution called kanemizu which is a mixture of iron fillings, vinegar, tea and rice wine. During the Middle Ages, women removed their eyebrows and eyelashes and plucked their hairlines all the way back to achieve a high forehead. The idea behind it was to resemble the head of a baby, which made the women appear pure and innocent. Of course, there was also golden lotus and foot bandaging in China. Um, apparently, the most desirable girl should possess a three-inch foot, according to those times. Um, and I think that this points to the fact that beauty is changing. If Plato is correct in his argument that we find things or people beautiful due to their resemblance to the form of beauty, then our perceptions of beauty wouldn't change so much. Although, I must say, my philosophy level is literally just from taking A-level philosophy, so I might have misinterpreted things, I might, you might disagree, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people disagree with me, so um, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. But whether beauty is an unchanging, everlasting concept as suggested by Plato, or whether lacking a true essence, what we know is that to be considered beautiful in today's society does change the way that your life plays out. Leo Tolstoy said in 1889, it is amazing how complete is the delusion that beauty is goodness. From the moment our parents start reading bedtime stories to us, we are attacked with subliminal messages equating beauty to goodness and ugliness to evil. Little girls dress up as their favourite Disney princess and grow up their hair, hoping to one day be as kind and desired as Cinderella or Snow White, the fairest of them all. Beautiful, innocent girls are contrasted against the ugly and evil villains. And this plays out in real life with higher salaries, higher grades and higher relationship outcomes. So employers viewing photographs of potential employees were inclined to increase salaries by nearly 10.5% to attractive people. Attractive female students earn higher grades than unattractive ones, and there's a higher relationship success. So research shows that attractive people are seen as more sociable, which then fosters better communication skills and more potential relationships, both platonically and romantically. And this really stood out to me when I was watching um, Love is Blind Brazil. There's a couple called Paulo, I think it's Paulo and Amanda, and she is a larger fat woman. She, so they, they essentially fall, well, as they describe, fall in love. Um, behind the screen so that they have they have no idea what the other one looks like and he's saying like i want to be married to you like i love you i'm so in love with you da -na 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 -na. like you're the most amazing woman and when he sees her 
he literally freaks out like nearly passes out <laughs> it's so embarrassing uh, he's like i need i need to i need to take a seat and he says that she's too strong a woman for him and that she's like this really empowered woman and he's not strong enough to be the man by her side but to me it's very very evident that he was not expecting a fat black woman to be in front of him and he was expecting a skinny white girl um it honestly boiled my blood because they had such a good connection emotionally um but it really shows to you that like the way that you look does have an impact on your life and in the beauty myth wolf describes a scene that i think is all too familiar to us today the double image as she says of the older man lined up and distinguished seated beside a nubile heavily made up female junior which as she describes became a paradigm for the relationships between men and women in the workplace as someone who's interested in going into broadcast journalism one of the things that has been said to me by multiple people is that i have the face for it or that i'm pretty so i'll do well more than i've heard people tell me that i'd actually be good at the job and i don't want to sound like oh i'm so pretty my life is so hard it's kind of exhausting just having people be like you're so pretty um i just want to point out that the fact that we often struggle to see women as actual multifaceted human beings Griffin and Langlois published a study investigating whether beauty is good or ugly is bad, and they reported that unattractive women are at a disadvantage relative to either medium or attractive women. It's more often the case that unattractiveness is bad than that beauty is good. They explain that unattractive faces that are perceived as less face-like, less familiar and less typical may function like other ambiguous stimuli and elicit greater neural activation in certain regions of the brain than more attractive faces. I'm not a scientist, so this doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, but apparently recent neuroimaging research indicates greater brain activation in the human amygdala to ambiguous stimuli and greater activation associated with social anxiety, suggesting that social stimuli that are more difficult to categorize may be perceived as negative or threatening manner because of their ambiguity. So if, if any of my science friends, um, this will probably make a lot more sense to you. I hope that that means something. <laughs> but if the phrase beauty is in the eye of the beholder is true, then how can we make this distinction? Do the findings of the study suggest not that unattractiveness is bad, but rather that unf unfamiliarity is bad? If this is the case, the more we expose children to different kinds of beauty, the less impact pretty privilege will have on society. Amir Srinivasan raises an important discussion of fuckability, so I wanted to read to you an extract from her book, The Right to Sex, which I'm just going to read out of my book because there's nothing else I can really add to this. She just puts it so perfectly. The bodies of brown and black women, especially when they belong to women who are also poor, incarcerated or undocumented, are in an important sense supremely fuckable, much more so than the bodies of white women. For these bodies can be violated with impunity and without consequence. Black women's bodies are coded as hypersexual, inviting and demanding men's sexual attention, while conferring on the men who have access to them less social status than they gain by having access to the supposedly chaste and innocent bodies of white women. This is the part which I found really interesting. She says, Fuckability is not some good that should be distributed more fairly. It isn't a good at all. Catherine Cross, a sociologist and gaming critic, writes, To some white men, Asian women top their hierarchies of desirability. But what do those women get out of that? Suffocating stereotypes of docility, discrimination, abuse. These are the wagings of being in someone else's hierarchy. And this is a point that I found so, so poignant to me, is that we kind of assume that pretty women or conventionally attractive women have this privilege um, and that means that they don't really struggle with that and there aren't any downsides. But this really points it out that what do what do you get out of being an attractive desirable woman is it actually beneficial to you at all i don't know is pretty privilege all that good whilst it can give one advantages surely it comes with its downfalls When you are attractive, your self-worth is completely propped up by your appearance and your value is completely rooted in how you look. Um, I'm going off script now um, because I just wanted to talk about my own personal experience with this. 
So, <laughs> um, up until I would say sick form, up until I was about 16, 17, I was ugly. I guess you could say from the ages of 12 to 16, I was ugly. Um, and I know I still had a lot of privilege during that time. I mean, I have pretty light skin. I have, um, pretty loose curls, but I don't think that pretty privilege was something that I was really experiencing during that time. (laughs) Um, and I was really happy. Honestly, I rooted my self-worth so much in my personality and in my intelligence. And I just didn't really, I didn't really think about how I looked that much, really. I mean, I just kind of got so used to looking ugly every day that it wasn't like if I looked ugly one day, I had a bad day. Um, I mean, this isn't entirely true because I was very body conscious, but, um, so during the pandemic I would say I had quite a bit of a glow up um I kind of lost the puppy fat and started working out and learned how to do makeup and got into fashion all of that stuff that kind of the material things that make people perceive you as more attractive um when I then went to my new sick form I was kind of seen as attractive like I've, I've received a bit of male attention and ever since then my life has not been the same um I rate myself so much on my looks. I have so much pressure on myself to look good all the time because I think if I don't, if I have a day where I don't look good, I it's a bad day. People aren't going to like me. People aren't going to respect me. And I just, I feel myself kind of crawling back into the hole of pre glow up me. And I, and at the time, like I'm saying, I didn't care about how I looked, but I did, I did know, like I knew that people didn't find me attractive. Um, and I n- also noticed that people wanted to be friends with me more. Um, yeah, like I made friends a lot easier. I mean, I've, I've had a big group of friends at sick form. Um, and I'm not saying that those people only liked me because of how I looked, but every time I now feel ugly, I feel myself going back to that. Um, and I think this is something that a lot of people who have glow ups deal with. Um, I'm going back to the script now because that was a bit of a ramble. Another like downside of pretty privilege is that we have such a black and white view of women as either pretty but superficial or as intelligent but ugly. And I think this is really shown in Modern Family, which I've only watched a few episodes of. I don't know it hugely well, but um, I think the contrast between Alex and Hayley Dunphy really shows this. So <laughs> Modern Family Wiki, which I can't believe I'm actually citing as a reputable source, <laughs> Um, said that while Alex is smart, introverted and geeky, Hayley is shallow, outgoing and popular. And I think that that also comes with the dumb blonde trope or the brainless beauty trope, which to me is especially bad because it often comes hand in hand with over sexualization, as we see in Karen from Mean Girls. And this leads to the huge undervaluing of intelligence. We have a really hard time wrapping our head around the fact that anyone, but especially a woman, can be both good looking and smart and I think that's why I received that comment that I said at the beginning that I showed at the beginning um questioning my intelligence because they thought that I was attractive Naomi Wolf puts this really really well in the beauty myth she says the message was finalized the most emblematic working woman in the west could be visible if they were beautiful even if they were bad at their work they could be good at their work beautiful and therefore visible but get no credit for their merit or They could be good and unbeautiful and therefore invisible, so their merit did them no good. In the last resort, they could be as good and as beautiful as you please for too long, upon which, ageing, they disappeared. I have dealt with this personally in my own life. I have a really good friend now, who now I'm friends with. Um, But when I first went to school, she was just this stunning gorgeous girl who got great grades and I remember thinking like oh she must be a bitch like she must be horrible because I could not wrap around my head the idea that this girl was beautiful talented like talented in all areas like she was intelligent she was good at music um she was good at sports and she could actually be a nice person um and bell hooks touches on this in communion where she talks about mothers being jealous of their daughters and how that often creates a lot of tension in mother-daughter relationships. I think we've all seen, we've all, 
perhaps even said it ourselves we've all heard other women say like oh don't you just hate her like don't you just hate women who can eat like that oh she's so um she eats so much junk but she's got such a fast metabolism like i literally hate women like that oh um i hate her because she's so thin but i guess it's good motivation for me and it's just it's so toxic it's so toxic um but we have to kind of if there's a woman who we see as beautiful we have to find a flaw in them we have to find something to hate because otherwise our jealousy gets the best of us and that's something that attractive women deal with all the time it's this constant hatred from other women when they haven't actually done anything wrong so i recently saw a tiktok that a girl made about rejoining the dating scene as a pretty girl and she was talking about all of the stuff that she has to deal with basically about men being superficial and kind of only being with her until they get what they want and then leaving and not really caring about anything other than her looks and i saw this comment saying all this pretty privilege nonsense is so tone deaf and a humble brag you really expect us to feel bad for you because you're hot i think that basically sums up what i'm trying to say with this video is that attractive women have so much advantage because of how they look but they also have to deal with so much baggage and shit that comes with it and then they're not even taken seriously when they try to complain and like raise their concerns because her being attractive doesn't take away from the fact that she's dealt with what she is saying she has dealt with and hear me out on this <laughs> i just this is again off script it's basically off my personal experience but i've noticed that when i get when i go out to walk my dog in trackies um, my hair in a messy bun, no makeup on, I get very little to none, basically, yeah, I get no male attention, essentially, and this isn't 100% bad, I mean, I look about 12 years old, so I would be worried if I did get a lot of male attention, but, um, I've noticed that there's a big difference in how I get treated, you know, when I get doled up, when I have a nice outfit on, nice makeup on, when I'm going out, um, I get a lot more male attention, and this isn't, actually very good um sometimes it can be nice i guess but a lot of the time it's really really threatening and i think that this comes to the fact that there is a big difference in how heterosexual women perceive male attention versus how heterosexual men perceive female attention and i've talked to a few of my guy friends on this so it's not like a study it's just based on my observation i think when men get attention from women a lot of the time it's it's like flattering it's a compliment they they really like it perhaps it comes down to the fact that women don't generally show men attention as much as men show women attention um but a lot of the time when it's girls who are receiving attention from boys it's actually really really scary when i get attention from men a lot of the time it is genuinely terrifying <laughs> because i am thinking this guy who was looking at me weirdly or um kind of asked for my number is he gonna follow me home is he gonna stalk me like am i gonna get home alive tonight i think that's a real fear for a lot of women and a lot of the time based on real experiences that we have um because i think so much of the time male attention is synonymous with threat i think that that's something that perhaps more women who have more pretty privilege have to deal with more often than women who don't have as much pretty privilege based on how I am perceived when I look good conventionally versus don't, if that makes sense. I think that the most depressing thing about pretty privilege is that even those who are bestowed with conventionally attractive features and cruise through life are essentially on a ticking time bomb until they get discarded as valueless old women. In Marcus and Linda's study on how gendered ageism affects professional women, they found that 80% of those surveyed experienced some form of gendered ageism. 
with a third of all respondents saying that they felt they could not get a job or an interview because of their age, and 47% saying that their most common experiences were feeling opinions were ignored, 42% saying that the most common experiences were seeing younger colleagues get attention, and 35% saying that it was not being invited to key meetings. Because of our society's obsession with beauty being equated to goodness, women are viewed not only as less attractive, but less competent and valuable when they show visible signs of ageing. This means that no one can escape discrimination based on how you look, because although you may be the Monroe of your time whilst in your 20s, once you get to your early to mid 30s, everyone will have forgotten about you. Think of how Molly Ringwald was the face of the 80s, landing role after role in big hits like in The Breakfast Club, Pretty in Pink and Sixteen Candles, and how nowadays she plays one-dimensional side character mums like in films like The Kissing Booth. This is changing. Actresses like Laura Dern, Emma Thompson and Kate Winslet are continuing to take on roles with complex characters as they age, but Winslet has said that she has had to be very selective in choosing her roles in order to manage this. The reality is, the way things are at the moment, women can never win. Either we're pretty, superficial, dumb and more vulnerable, or the opposite. I had an interesting conversation with an ex-boyfriend who was saying he didn't understand why privilege was given the word privilege. Because privilege feels like something, I mean, it's kind of synonymous with lucky, right? Um, but it doesn't really make sense when you're talking about things that definitely aren't luck. Being born white, being born into a wealthier family, being born conventionally attractive is nothing to do with luck. It's to do with a lot bigger societal structures. Um, so he was saying perhaps if we use the word advantage it, advantage, it would make a lot more sense because that kind of, it doesn't imply unfairness, but it just is quite neutral. It's just an advantage that you have. And that allows us to recognise that there are also downsides. So if we saw prettiness as an advantage rather than a privilege, perhaps it would allow us to have these conversations about the downsides that pretty women face. I believe that detaching our worth and our value from how we look is the only way forward to be taken seriously regardless of our attractiveness. Although this is true for both women and men, I think that women's worth is particularly attached to our appearance, and we're told so by everything and everyone around us from a very young age. I mean, think about all of those family dinners where someone's talking about the ugly cousin or the fat cousin. Uh, I think those things affect us more than we give them credit for. I think that we have to start learning to see beauty in all of its different forms, unlike suggested by Plato, and learning to question why we judge things the way we do, which is why I would really suggest this book, The Right to Sex by Amir Srinivasan. She really talks about the politics of sexual preference and helps you kind of unpack why you judge people the way that you do. Um, and I think that's really, really important. So if you've enjoyed this video, thank you so much for watching. I feel like it was a bit rambly, but I just wanted to do bits of it unscripted to make it more natural and more um, personal. So I hope you've enjoyed it. And if you disagree or agree or have any thoughts, then let me know in the comments below. I love reading everybody's thoughts. It really makes my day. <laughs> so thank you so much. And I hope you have a lovely week. And I'll see you next time.